Welcome to week two, session one, that's 21 of the um, summer school on large language models. Uh, all, of the, all of the videos from the first week are online now at the link that you can find on the, uh, that you, in the WordPress document or uh, write to me and I'll send you the link. Um, our speaker today, oh, and there's two changes, well, one change, one swap in the program. Um, Danilo Vizdok will be speaking today at the time that would have been uh, Tom Griffiths because Tom Griffiths got a serious COVID and he'll be, he's transferred optimistically to Friday, the last session where, where Danilo had been. So this will be Alessandro Lenzi and the next will be uh, Danilo Vizdok. Uh, I will read his bio when, uh, when it's his turn. The talk by, by Alessandro is the missing links. Well, you see it on your screen. I won't say that. Mm -hmm. uh, Alessandro is professor of linguistics and director of the computational linguistics uh, laboratory, Koling, uh, University of Pisa. His main research interests are computational linguistics, natural language processing, semantics, and cognitive science. And with that, I hand it over to Alessandro. Welcome. Uh, thanks a lot, Stephen, for this introduction, and thanks a lot also for uh, inviting me to, to this fantastic summer school. It's really an honor and a pleasure to, to talk to all of you. Uh, so uh, I will uh, start uh, with uh, I mean, just uh, something I, I did uh, yesterday on uh, using the last version of ChatGPT, and, and, and I asked the model a question like this, uh, a new type of robot called Blimp as a kind of artificial arm as one of its parts, the arm as a hook. And then I asked the model, is the hook a part uh, of the Blimp? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is uh, actually the answer that uh, I got from the system, which is uh, uh, not only correct, so it infers that uh, yes, the hook uh, is a part of the Blimp, but it's also very, uh, a very analytical, uh, uh, logical explanation of its application of uh, the transitive property of uh, uh, part of uh, uh, part of relations, and this also concerns uh, an invented entity like uh, uh, a blimp. And uh, uh, so, um, in in a way, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to imagine that this is not really something close to uh, natural human natural language understanding. And although this is this is what we experience uh, uh, every time we we we, we usually uh, we use models like uh, uh, ChatGPT, uh, part of the I mean the, the main argument of my talk today is that uh, there is still what I will call a semantic gap in uh, large language models, uh, which uh, uh, we can define by saying that the large language models still lack. Uh, 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 substantial aspects of uh, human semantic competence. I want to stress uh, uh, the word still. So I'm not saying that these models will never be able to, to fill this gap. Uh, I'm saying that uh, nowadays, uh, and perhaps the, the model as they are, uh, still have some uh, limits in uh, specific aspects of uh, uh, human semantic competence. And uh, part of, I mean, the talk today will be exactly to try to investigate where this semantic gap lies, which aspects are uh, uh, are concerned, and also possibly imagining which kind of uh, uh, which kind of steps are necessary in order to to fill it. Part of my arguments uh, are also very uh, sympathetic with, with the position that has been advanced by Kyle and Mawald and others uh, in, in their papers, uh, in which they distinguish between uh, formal uh, linguistic competence of uh, uh, large language models, and which is, I mean, knowledge of linguistic rules and patterns, ability of producing uh, lang linguistic expressions that are uh, formally undistinguishable uh, from human ones, and what they call functional competence, namely a real ability to understand and use a language as uh, as we do. And part of the arguments by Kyle and others is exactly that the language lar large language models have. Uh, an almost human-like formal competence, but still, I mean, fall short of uh, a lot of aspects of uh, uh, functional uh, functional competence. 
Uh, first of all, I, I would like to uh, to remind uh, uh, to, to start from the basics, or at least uh, to start from the past, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we should never forget that what uh, large language models are actually are and where they come from. Okay, so basically they are uh, they are just uh, let's say the, the last generation of uh, uh, what we used to call distributional semantic models, namely. Uh, models that uh, uh, really uh, um, extract uh, in, in knowledge from uh, uh, textual data and they uh, use to, uh, let's say, to represent the meanings, uh, aspects of the meaning of linguistic expressions in vectors, so embeddings that uh, uh, are supposed to encode the statistical distribution of words in linguistic context. And uh, in fact, uh, I mean, if we look at uh, uh, the uh, uh, these pictures, uh, which we could, I mean, I mean, it's called the trees of large language models. Uh, we can see that uh, the, the large amounts and numbers of models that have appeared in all these uh, years uh, are just uh, derived by as I have the roots in exactly models that were very popular until. Uh, a few years ago, like word to vec fast text, and glove, uh, uh, and so on. So on the one hand, uh, uh, there is uh, something which is uh, uh, old in the sense that it's something uh, really uh, that we uh, that that we already have seen for many years. And on the other hand, there is also also something genuinely new uh, in these models. So first of all, we I mean, like the, the previous generations of uh, what we used to call predict uh, distribution semantics models, like exactly word to back. The idea is that uh, large language models can acquire knowledge from text corpora only by train with uh, a self-supervised string prediction task. So they basically, uh, rep I mean, acquire information about the meaning of words uh, by predicting which other words they concur with uh, in, the, in context. And that this is exactly basically the same learning objective of GPT, like used to be, uh, for instance, for uh, word to back. On the other hand, there is also something genuinely new in, the, in these models that we all know, uh, which, is, uh, which is also the, first of all, we know that there are much more complex and deeper narrow architectures with respect to the previous generation distribution and semantic models. They are training on much larger amount of, uh, uh, of data. That's another things that we need to take into consideration. And also, and this is also really the, the most surprising aspects in a way, uh, they, uh, they, uh, the array of knowledge that uh, they are acquired from data by this model, it's much larger than uh, the previous generation distributional, uh, distributional models. So traditional distribution semantics models like word to vec for instance, were essentially conceived as models of the lexicon. So they, they were supposed to acquire uh, knowledge about lexical, uh, uh, lexical types. On the other hand, we know that uh, large language models encode the really non-trivial aspects of uh, syntactic structures, as we also see in the last week, for instance, in, uh, in, uh, in, various, in various talks, uh, important aspects of sentence and discourse meaning, uh, word knowledge, but also pragmatic dimensions. And all of these things uh, put together is a result in that surprising behavior that uh, we have seen in the in the first slide uh, when they are uh, they are asked to solve also uh, a questions about a semantic questions about uh, 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 part of uh, part of relations now the problem is exactly this so if we assume if we remind us that uh, basically large language models are just the distributional devices so the, the devices that learn what they know uh, entirely uh, through distributional learning from contextual uh, inform from linguistic information the question is whether does uh, whether distributional learning really suffices in filling the semantic gap so is distributional learning enough in order to uh, acquire uh, human-like semantic competence, and of course, uh, this in turn uh, can this question uh, should be split uh, can be split into two further questions, namely, okay, but wh when we speak about the human semantic competence, what does it consist of? I mean, what is the semantic competence? And then, of course, uh, which aspects of this semantic competence competence can be learned from uh, uh, from distributional from distributional data? So uh, uh, there is a, a, a widespread claim 
uh, an argument that basically uh, uh, the semantic, uh, that indeed the large language model have a semantic gap, but this semantic gap would mainly reside in their lack of referential grounding in the external world. So this is uh, exactly a picture uh, taken from the, uh, the paper by Bender and Kohler in 2020, where they proposed this so-called octopus argument, which is a kind of a revisitation and uh, uh, renewal uh, uh, Chinese, argument, Chinese room argument by, by, by John Sir, which is basically, well, uh, any kind of entity which is just trained on uh, learning distributional statistics uh, is not able to acquire only by distributional statistics aspects that refer to, uh, to the world. Of course, uh, this, this is uh, an aspect that uh, uh, mainly concern uh, uh, and essentially concern text only large language models. So language models are essentially trained on, uh, uh, on, text, uh, on text only. Well, we know that there are other type of uh, uh, large language models, uh, multimodal ones, like also uh, the generation, the last generation of GPT, like GPT-4, GPT-4.0, uh, and others, what indeed uh, seem to have uh, uh, also some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, ability to refer and to link language uh, to the world. This is just another try I did yesterday with a very popular a uh, uh, picture that is taken, we usually taken in Pisa, where there are some tourists that are try to, uh, the, I mean, they, they, uh, they, they take a picture in which it, it seems that they hold uh, uh, the Leaning Tower, but it's just an effect of the perspective. And the description that uh, is given by the model, it's in a way quite surprising, because it says that the image shows a person standing in front of the Leaning Tower, appearing to hold the tower, in, with one hand due to the perspective of the photograph. And then there are a lot of information that that uh, 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 that uh, concern really uh, reference. So the fact that the person, there is a person, that this person wears uh, a straw hat and a black shirt and a, uh, a red, carries a red bag uh, uh, and so on. So it's also appeared that in a way, it's true, uh, text models, uh, text only models cannot grasp uh, uh, referential aspects of the world, but uh, I mean, uh, these models are can be can be made multimodal and also integrated with information concerning not only extracted not only from language, but also from other uh, modalities like images. So uh, I think that, uh, and this is also, this is essentially the main argument uh, of, of my talk, is the fact that, yes, it's true. I mean, uh, surely uh, grounding and uh, uh, reference to the world is an important limit of many uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, large language models, especially the ones only trained on text. But there are also other aspects uh, that, uh, um, uh, that I mean, the, the semantic gaps concerns other aspects uh, of their semantic competence. And for this, uh, I, will, uh, I, will, I, will, I will rely on, on a distinction, which, is, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, some years ago by an Italian uh, philosopher of language, Diego Marconi, uh, who distinguished between uh, uh, inferential and referential semantic yeah. competence. So, uh, Marconi talks about the referential competence as the ability to map uh, lexical items onto the world. So basically, which is exactly what we have seen uh, in action uh, uh, when the model was able, for instance, to, to, to understand that there was a, a woman with a red bag uh, in the picture. Or when we, for instance, we, we say hard work uh, and, we, and we are able to, to point to, to the specific animal that our, the name hard work refers to. But besides the referential competence, uh, there is also another crucial aspect uh, of the human semantic knowledge, which is what uh, Marconi calls inferential competence, which is the ability uh, to, uh, um, to manage a connection among words, uh, underline some performance as a semantic inference, paraphrase, uh, uh, find any synonym, and so forth. And what is inferential competence? Inferential competence is, for instance, knowledge that uh, an aardvark uh, is a mammal, that uh, an aardvark has legs, uh, and all this type of uh, knowledge information, is, which is also relevant in order to draw inferences about aardvark, independently of our ability to refer to that actual animal uh, in, in the world. Well, uh, basically, 
there is a common argument uh, in uh, on large language model and their understanding capability that uh, actually, let's say, inferential competence uh, is in principle not a problem for these models in the sense that uh, the idea is the fact that uh, 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 the idea is the fact that uh, uh, actually uh, those aspects of meaning that these uh, the large language model would acquire would exactly be those aspects of meaning that uh, concern inferential semantic competence. For instance, uh, uh, Piantadosi and Hill in 2022, but also similar uh, position was taken by Ellie Public uh, in, uh, in, a, in a more recent papers. Uh, they actually claim that the meaning that the large language models acquire from text uh, corresponds to what they call the role that concepts play in some theory, in some greater mental theory. Okay, and they actually link their position, their argument, so to the so-called conceptual role theory or theory theory of concepts, uh, which was uh, uh, um, argued for by Gilbert Arman in 1982, namely the fact that the concepts are a representation whose content is determined by the relations they have with other concepts and specified by some kind of mental theory. In a way, this part of information here, so the fact that Harvard is a mama, Harvard has legs, are just bits of this uh, theory, of our theory about, uh, uh, for instance, Harvard, uh, that uh, is made also of relation, specific relations that this concept has with other type of concepts, like, for instance, mama, legs, uh, and so on. So uh, the idea is that uh, this is exactly the information that uh, large language model acquire from text. So they acquire, uh, they represent concepts uh, with a role in some uh, theory. So they are able to acquire from text, uh, let's say a theory of concepts or let's say uh, concepts in the sense of uh, a kind of uh, theory that specify their relations uh, that connect with other concepts and so on. Uh, given this assumption that this is exactly the type of uh, meaning representation that the language language model acquired from text through distributional learning, uh, the conclusion that we can draw is the fact that, well, since uh, uh, conceptual uh, role uh, theory, uh, or uh, let's say the, 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 this type of knowledge representation is exactly what uh, 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 what support uh, inferential semantics, uh, large language models uh, do acquire inferential semantics from distributional statistics. Uh, moreover, uh, there is also a further uh, argument, which is uh, um, uh, um, taken by, by various uh, uh, authors, that actually uh, even uh, text-only models uh, can also fill the referential semantic gap since uh, there is uh, the possibility of mapping. So a, a mapping exists between, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the semantic space, the distributional semantic space acquired by these models uh, uh, onto the perceptual and physical uh, and physical spaces. And since this map exists and it's possible to be, uh, we can learn this mapping, uh, even a model that uh, uh, acquires uh, only information from text uh, is able in a way to acquire some form of referential uh, semantics uh, exactly because of this kind of alignment between language and, and the perceptual spaces and the physical spaces. And this is basically, I think, a kind of uh, uh, revisitation or let's say uh, the different, I mean, it's very similar uh, to what uh, Max Lowers uh, also called the symbol interdependency hypothesis, namely that since the sensory motor information is encoded in language, through language statistics, we can also acquire the sensory motor uh, information uh, about the external, the external world. Uh, well, basically, uh, uh, so the, the, what I will try to, uh, to, um, to investigate and, and I will present you in, 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 this, in this talk is exactly something that is related to the question whether distributional learning suffices to let, let a large language model at least acquire some true inferential semantic competence. And so basically, uh, the questions I want to ask is whether large language models do acquire a true conceptual theory. 
So is it this, is it is it correct to uh, to uh, to understand the distribution of semantic space uh, uh, in terms of uh, a conceptual theory in the sense uh, of uh, of this sense here so in the sense of harman in the sense of uh, uh, the theory theory uh, uh, of concepts uh, and so again uh, what aspects of inferential semantics can or cannot be learned from distributional data alone well, on the one hand, if we go back to the first slide of my talk, and we can see this uh, very beautiful logical uh, uh, logical argument that is presented and this inference, uh, it seems that all these questions have already been have already an answer. So yes, these models can do all these things because I mean, if they are able to to carry out this, that type of inference, uh, uh, we should uh, at least uh, uh, assume that they, are, they have indeed uh, inferential semantics, uh, that they indeed have, uh, uh, they are able, they, they possess kind of conceptual theories uh, uh, of entities that they have learned from distribution that alone. But I think that uh, if we investigate these issues more closely and more, let's say, systematically, uh, well, the, I think that the gap, uh, a gap still exists. So again, uh, uh, they these models do acquire a lot of information from text, but uh, uh, whether this information, so the, the knowledge they, they extract from text uh, can genuinely be described as a true conceptual theory is, uh, is questionable. Okay, uh, first of all, I will present you a couple of, of ongoing work that uh, I'm doing with uh, some of my uh, uh, from, from collaborators in my group. And, and one of this, uh, uh, of this research concerns exactly meronymy. So the part whole relation that we have seen uh, uh, in the example at the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this talk. And as we said, I mean, the part whole relation is an important aspect of uh, inferential competence. And, Let's say having, if we have a theory of an entity, we also know which are their parts, uh, which things are not their parts, and so on. And uh, one key property of the of the of meronymy is asymmetry. So understand meronymy is an asymmetric relation. So uh, if A is a part of B, uh, necessarily B is not a part of uh, 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 is not a part of A. And so the question is whether uh, the language models uh, knows the parts of objects and especially knows uh, the, the part or that the part or relation uh, is truly uh, truly symmetric. To investigate this issue, uh, we have collected some meronyms from uh, um, uh, various sources. We use the MacRae norms, which are uh, human generated uh, uh, features for uh, uh, um, a number of uh, uh, in concepts. And so we extracted the, all the features uh, uh, that were uh, um, uh, that were specifically labeled as, as meronyms. And we also extract the part of relations from ConceptNet, which is another uh, uh, handmade uh, conceptual network based on, on also on human or human judgments. In the whole, uh, we we extracted the nine hundred uh, almost one thousand part all pairs from McRae, and again uh, another one thousand approximately one thousand part all pairs from from ConceptNet. And uh, we wanted to test whether uh, different type of language models, uh, uh, how these how these language models uh, deal with the, with the, with the meronymy information. And we use uh, uh, we did experiments with three models. The first one is uh, Lama two without uh, instruction tuning. Namely, this is really a foundational model. This means that uh, Lama two uh, only is only uh, acquires information from the uh, prediction uh, learning objective that we have seen before. So it's a, it's a basic distributional model. Then we use uh, a, a, an instruction version of a instruction tuned version of Lama two, which is basically a language model that has been instruction tuned and so on is specialized for uh, for for chat, uh, and then we also uh, use the GPT-4 model that also has been uh, tuned by, which is uh, way bigger than than the other the, the other models, uh, and it has also been uh, uh, tuned with uh, uh, reinforcement learning from uh, uh, human feedback. We uh, tested with these models on two tasks using prompting. 
and uh, we, we, we prompt these models uh, on uh, a question task about uh, meronymy and on a statement task, which is basically target exactly the same type of uh, informations, uh, but in a different way, also because uh, we know that uh, prompting can be subjected to different type of uh, to variations also in the way uh, the task uh, is formulated. So, in, for instance, in the in the questions task, uh, the prompt was your task is to answer the following questions. So you must answer strictly with yes or no. The question is the wheel a part of the car? While in the statement task, uh, we presented the state the, the part of relation is a statement. That the wheel is a part of the car, and uh, the, the model has to answer true or false uh, in, in the task. Uh, now, uh, the, the important thing is that uh, we tested each meronymy pair, X and Y, in a, dira in a direct and a swap test. What is, the, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that in the direct test, uh, the, the, the sentence was presented uh, in this way, the X is a part of the Y, and uh, uh, the correct answer was true. Uh, why in the swap test uh, we presented the the, 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 senti the sentence in the reverse that I, the reverse order and we said that the y is a part of the x uh, and in, in this case the correct answer was false okay and uh, uh, we defined what we uh, called the meronymy knowledge criterion what I mean by this that uh, we can assume that the model knows, that the pair XY is an instance of meronymy, if and only if the model correctly solves the direct and the swap test for the, pa for, for the pair XY. So basically, uh, uh, a model knows that uh, a wheel is a part of a car, only if I, if I, if I say it's true to the statement uh, the wheel is a part of the car, and false uh, to the statement that the car is a part of the wheel uh, as uh, in, in the swap direction. Now, uh, the, what we found is the fact that uh, 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 these are actually the results uh, that we got uh, uh, for the models. And uh, this is the, the global accuracy of the models. Uh, and uh, on the left, uh, it's the question task. Uh, in the right, the statement task. Uh, and the blue is uh, the, the concept net data set. Uh, and, uh, the yellow one uh, is the McRae uh, data set. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, if we start with, the, with the, let's say, foundation models, so the, just the one uh, trained with distributional learning, performance is really, really bad, in the sense that uh, uh, there is a, just a 27% of accuracy, for instance, uh, on uh, uh, concept net uh, in the uh, question uh, uh, task, which is uh, approximately the 1% of the statement task. And in general, you can see that the statement task uh, is much harder than uh, for the models than the, uh, the question task. Uh, an improvement exists uh, in, the, in, in the instruction tuned one. So LAMA, you can see it performs better. And of course, I mean, the best model is GPT-4, but notice that uh, in the concept net, uh, even the best models, uh, the best model reaches, for instance, on concept net, uh, just the 69% of accuracy on the, on, the, on the question task uh, and the 66% of accuracy in the, um, in, the, uh, in the statement task. And in, in these cases, we have also to, to, to remind that uh, um, to remember that uh, uh, GPT-4 is not only is not a foundation model, so it, it has uh, the statistics extracted from text plus a large amount also of uh, 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 in, in refinement due to the human reinforcement learning. And even more, GPT-4 is not only trained only on text, but it's also multimodal. So it has been trained also on, uh, on images. So in this sense, there is also information coming from uh, external to, uh, to language. And despite uh, uh, the dimension, there is uh, still quite a big gap in the, uh, in the ability to, 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 to properly recognize uh, meronymy and the directionality of meronymy, the symmetry of meronymy. Then we, we, we also wanted to understand the, the fact that we also wanted to explore the fact that maybe this performance uh, might be due to the fact that these models uh, do not know some of the meronyms. So although it might be unlikely given the, the amount of text they've been trained on, that's still a possibility. 
So basically, we uh, and we know that all these models are models that are especially optimized for generation. So they are all generative models, all decoder only large language models. So they are optimized for uh, text generation. And so we, we, we also design a, a part generation task. So in these cases, the task of the model was to generate part of objects. Okay, and we gave the models the holonyms, so the, the concepts, the, the target holonyms that we use in the, in the previous experiments, we asked the model to, to generate uh, parts. And these are the statistics. So you see that uh, uh, we, we only did this with the, with the two uh, mod better models, so the two best models, so GPT-4 and the LAMA Instruct, because the, the non-instruct model was, the performance was, uh, um, and since this model is not optimized for uh, chat in, uh, in a way that uh, we, we expect it to have, uh, in any case, uh, a, a very noisy result. So uh, you can see here that uh, uh, they, these models generate uh, a lot of parts, a lot of meronyms. Uh, and uh, we also uh, carried out the manual validations on, of all these meronyms. And you can see that we validated all the meronyms generated by LAMA, with, uh, which I, and we got an accuracy of uh, almost 93%. Uh, so all 93% of the, of the parts were uh, correctly generated, were correct parts. And also we did a, a sample, uh, we, we took also a random sample of 300 holonyms and we uh, correct and we uh, manually validated all the parts generated for these three holonyms. And we, again, for GPT-4, the accuracy is very high uh, on between uh, around 97.5% of accuracy. So, this means that these models generate a lot of parts, know a lot of parts of these of, of these entities, and so we then we we decide to carry out uh, another experiment, which is exactly to say, okay, let's try to test these models on you uh, on the uh, on on the same task uh, that we have seen before. So the question and the statement task uh, to understand. Uh, uh, the, um, for for meronym for meronymy identification by using as data the parts that they uh, were uh, generated by these models. So basically, the aim of this experiment was to answer a question like, but do these models know that the parts that they generated are actually parts and satisfy the asymmetric uh, uh, property of meronymy and the meronymy knowledge criterion? And this is what we got. And we can see that, uh, again, uh, for LAMA, uh, only approximately 45% of uh, all the parts, uh, so of all the meronyms that were uh, uh, provided, uh, given that were generated by the model, uh, were also recognized correctly uh, by the model itself as parts. And again, GPT-4 has a much higher performance, but notice that, for instance, uh, uh, in the question statements, it reached only 81%, which is goes down to 74% in the statement task. So this means that uh, even for GPT-4, approximately one fourth of the parts that were generated by these models were actually not recognized by these models as being part, didn't satisfy the, the meronymy uh, uh, knowledge criterion that I showed you before. So basically the conclusion is that uh, the, the large language models uh, do not always know that the parts they generate are, are parts, or they, they, do, they do not know that these parts uh, have the properties of, uh, of meronyms. And this is an instance of uh, which has been what has been called the generative AI paradox, namely the fact that in many cases these models uh, uh, perform much better in generation rather than in understanding. So in some sense, there is a mismatch between what they generate and what they truly understand from, from languages. And this case of Meronymy seems exactly uh, to be one instance, uh, uh, one example of this problem. As a last task on Meronymy, we also try to design uh, a, a Meronymy logic test. Uh, basically, the idea was to give uh, the model uh, sentence pair that differ for their truth conditions. You can see, for instance, uh, in some cases, one was true and the other was false. 
like the tail is a part of the dog, true, the dog is a part of the tail, false. In other case, both sentences are true, the tail is a part of the dog, the arm is a part of the body. In case, in, in the fourth case, in the third case, two, the two sentences are false. And then, then in the fourth case, is, uh, we have uh, the reverse of the first case. So the dog is a part of the tail, is false. And then the, the tail is a part of the dog, is true. And basically, uh, the idea uh, was, not, was exactly to test whether the model was able to assign the right uh, truth condition pairs to the sentences, again, to understand that this is true and the other is false, or in this case, to, understand, uh, to, to say that this is false and the other one uh, is true. Uh, and we did this test in, in one version, which is like this with this type of prompt. And in a second version of this prompt, we also give the model a, a rule to be applied. So we, we specifically ask the model to apply the rule uh, that uh, concerns uh, the asymmetry of Meron. So if I is a part of B, then B is not a part, uh, down, then B is not a part of A. And these are the results. Uh, and we, we carried out uh, this, uh, we performed these models, uh, this model, ex this experiment only on GPT-4, which as we have seen, is just the best model. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, notice that the models uh, without the rule, uh, they have uh, quite very high performance, 92% uh, in, uh, uh, in recognizing, for instance, that it uh, uh, correctly recognized the true false pair. But interestingly, this performance changes if the same sentences are presented in the reverse order. So uh, while in these cases, uh, uh, so when we have these cases, which the two sentences appear in the order true, false, uh, the performance is higher, but drops uh, 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 when uh, the, the, the order is reversed. Interestingly, by providing the rule that uh, should be applied by the model uh, in, in performing this task, uh, the performance of the model uh, drops uh, and is actually, uh, and so it makes uh, the model, uh, uh, it provides, I mean, it gives confusion. So it makes the, the model uh, be confounded rather than help the model uh, uh, even more. So, uh, and now in a second experiment, uh, in a second, uh, let's say, uh, case study, uh, we have been in the investigating, this is really something that is still to be largely completed, so just a really preliminary result. Uh, we investigated the causal relation. Uh, why causal relations? Because again, uh, cause effect connections are an important ingredient of uh, theories. Okay, so uh, knowing a theory of uh, events means also being an understanding whether uh, uh, these models, uh, two events, between two events, there is a causal relations, uh, causal relations or not. Uh, moreover, uh, causal relations uh, is uh, strictly related with temporal precedence uh, because the cause precedes the facts, uh, but causality is not merely temporal precedence. So uh, it can, the first causes, uh, uh, causes, causal relations cannot be reduced only to temporal presence. So so what we built was, is, a, is a data set of uh, sentence pairs uh, that contains uh, implicit causal relations. Namely, what I mean by this, uh, these sentences contain event pairs, uh, which are related by a causal, by causal relations because of our, mm, let's say, knowledge of the world. Uh, so let's say inferential knowledge uh, or uh, general knowledge, but uh, without, uh, uh, but they, they don't, they, they, there is no explicit connective link in the two sentences. Uh, and we had uh, 200 sentences uh, in which there is an implicit correlation, causal relations and 200 sentences by, uh, connected by an implicit temporal presence relation and 200 sentences that uh, are contain events that uh, are not con uh, linked neither by causal nor by temporal relations. And all these sentences were classified by uh, five expert annotators uh, in order to identify whether the two events were causally related, uh, temporally related, or uh, neither of them. I will focus uh, um, only on, on, the, on the, two, uh, the two cases of uh, causal, causal and temporal sentences. So uh, we uh, decided to understand whether semantic uh, uh, large language model were able to identify 
the correct uh, uh, relation and also the direction of these relations linking the two events by, let's say, understanding or by uh, uh, connecting, uh, sorry, there was an airplane passing by, uh, uh, by um, understanding whether the, uh, which was the uh, the connective uh, that explicitly the correct connective corresponds in to, to, to a certain relation. So this means that uh, starting from a certain event pair, we uh, design sentences uh, that uh, link the, the two the two original sentences by certain connective corresponding to causal relation where the cause. Uh, uh, precedes uh, the uh, the effect, uh, like in the first cases, a causal relations in which uh, the uh, the cause uh, follows uh, the uh, the, co uh, the, um, the effect, uh, and and again uh, the temporal relations in which the preceding event uh, precedes the second uh, the following event, uh, and the reverse situation in the four cases. So in these cases, A, B, we could consider a kind of iconic order in which the cause and the preceding event appears before the effect of the following event, and B, A, the anti-iconic order in which the cause and the preceding event appears after the effect of the following event. In these cases, each relation and order was explicitly associated with the, uh, with the connective. So what we did, we, we, we took... Uh, uh, four models uh, for large language model, uh, all of the instruction tuned family, so Bloom, Falcon, Lama, and Mistral. And basically, what we exploit, instead of using a prompting experiments, like in the case of Meronymy, we actually measure the perplexity of the sentence uh, with the models. So we use the models uh, in, let's say, in their original uh, uh, and more direct. Uh, uh, way of uh, providing uh, uh, the probability and so the perplexity of a certain uh, uh, sequence uh, uh, of elements given a context. And basically, we, we, uh, we see that uh, we designed uh, for each uh, event pairs four possible items uh, in which one, the connective was the correct one given the relation and given the direction of the relation. So Luke cut his hair because Luke hairs were too long, and that's the correct one. And three other distractors in which we have the same events in the same sentence, in the same order, but uh, uh, with connectives that were not consistent with the relations uh, uh, expressed by, uh, by the two events. And so basically the idea is the fact that a semantic relation and order is correctly identified if the model assigns a lower perplexity to the sentence containing the right connective. So in these cases, we expect that the perplexity assigned to the, by the model to the first sentence is lower than the perplexity um, uh, assigned to the other sentences. And in these cases, if so, we, we score the hit and we measure the accuracy. Okay, this is the, uh, the global accuracies of the models. And we see that in all the models, uh, the general accuracy is uh, uh, not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, is way over the baseline, but uh, it's also act is actually uh, uh, not uh, uh, beyond uh, the 60, 65, 65% uh, 65 uh, globally. But it's interesting to see uh, just also where the models uh, goes wrong. What is the confusion? What is the problems that these models? And I will show you just an example from uh, the best model uh, that uh, is the, 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 Mistral, the Mistral one. In these cases, you can see that, uh, okay, in the diagonal, we find uh, the correctly uh, understood uh, relations. Uh, we see that, for instance, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for instance, uh, even for the uh, causality uh, relations uh, that are in the direction A, B, so the, the cause precedes the, the effect, we, we have, uh, 78% uh, uh, of accuracy, but 12% uh, uh, of cases are confounded uh, uh, with the uh, uh, reverse uh, uh, with the reverse order. Interestingly, uh, the best results we are obtained when the models when the effect uh, is uh, presented after the uh, when the cause is presented after the effect. Notice that uh, in any cases uh, we found. Uh, 
that in the case of temporal precedence, we found a, a significant number of cases of temporal clauses, which are interpreted as being causal related. So this means that the model is very good at identifying causes when there are causes, uh, but the many cases of temporal, uh, simple temporal precedence are confounded uh, uh, to be uh, to be caused. And also there is uh, a quite a significant number of cases in which uh, the model also uh, confound the order uh, or the order of the events, which is again uh, a piece of evidence that these models uh, have, I mean, uh, uh, strive uh, uh, to uh, uh, to cope and to deal with uh, uh, the, dis the clear distinction between uh, uh, causal semantic relations versus temporal precedence relation, and also with concerning the order in which uh, these elements, uh, these relations uh, uh, are applied. So I'm coming to the uh, um, uh, and to some conclusions about uh, this the. Um, uh, about uh, from from the evidence I also showed you. So uh, again, uh, distributional semantics. Model, we started from the idea that uh, large language models are actually just distributional semantics models, uh, or just a derivation of this the same approach. Uh, truly, they identify highly sophisticated distribution associations between linguistic expressions. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I think that they, uh, they, they still lack uh, a semantic spaces uh, organized in terms of uh, through theories. And the fact that, the, the the that some of the evidence that I show you the, today are really consistent with other works that have been uh, carried out recently, other results that appear recently, in which it exactly, the, the, which exactly point uh, towards the same problem. So, so these models are really not able to recognize uh, 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 through theories uh, in the sense uh, uh, of, con uh, of concepts. Especially if we understand, if we remind what is a theory. So a theory is not just association. So a theory is a structure network of entities and events that are linked by relations that specify their functional role in a system. So understanding what a theory is means understanding that a cause something uh, X cause Y is not the same as X precedes Y, or A is a part of B is not the same as B is a part of A, uh, and so on. So basically, we can see that uh, the distributional semantic space of car, probably in, in even the, in the more complex model, uh, re uh, resembles uh, something like uh, on the left of this, uh, 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 of, this, uh, of this figure, while when we think about uh, a theory, or we talk about a theory, we, we, we should think about something closer uh, to the one in the in the right, in which we really have knowledge about CARMS in terms of uh, associations with other concepts, uh, which also make a split, uh, uh, in which the different role and the different uh, functions of the, the different entities in the overall theory is, uh, is taken into account and distinguished. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, I think that uh, another uh, piece of small piece of evidence. This I understand this is more anecdotal, but uh, I think it's a uh, it, it's a nice uh, um, it, it's, it's it's a nice aspect. Uh, and it could be a nice uh, aspect to to, re to reflect on. Uh, is exactly the fact that uh, even the largest models uh, in, encode a lot of uh, uh, features, a lot of aspects, but. Uh, uh, it's can some these models these the aspects are especially in many cases are uh, are described as being uh, uh, conceptuals and so on, but uh, actually uh, they are not uh, really semantic feature. Okay, what is this? Perhaps you have uh, read uh, this uh, the recent uh, uh, paper appeared by people from Anthropic uh, that was entitled "Mapping the Mind of a Large Language Model." in which basically they applied, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sparse encoding methods in order to identify uh, a certain, the features that are encoded by, uh, by large language models, and uh, also to identify which features are most activated by words uh, uh, in a, that are given the input uh, uh, to a large language model. 
Okay, in this uh, uh, paper, in this work by the people in Anthropic, uh, Anthropic, they also identify what they call a part of uh, member of a feature, which is exactly this one. So the feature, this is the number of the feature. And if you go to their site, you can visualize uh, what are the words that this uh, feature uh, uh, activates most. And correctly, we see that, for instance, uh, is the word part of uh, that activates most uh, this type of feature. But notice that in many instances of this uses of part of, uh, this is not uh, a real meronymic uh, relation. Notice uh, uh, we have something like, it was the point that realized that it was part of the problem and not part of the solution. Okay, they are all part of this great big conspiracy. They are part of me. So what does it mean? It means that this semantic, this uh, so-called alleged semantic feature, it's not really semantic features. It's the path, it's the pattern part of that these models uh, learn to encode. The problem is that the pattern part of is, a, of course, a way to express meronymy. But it's also a linguistic way to express other type of relations, or uh, is also used not to express really uh, uh, part of relations in the in the strict sense uh, sense of the term, right? So in these cases, you see it, again what we call semantic features are in real, actually in in some cases really very frequent patterns or the surface patterns that these models are learned to encode. But uh, I think that there is still a distinction between this pattern and this so-called feature and truly semantic feature and truly semantic dimensions that these models, uh, in, in some cases, uh, might not really uh, still uh, be able to, uh, to encode. And uh, uh, I would like also, uh, in, in, this, in this talk, I've, uh, uh, I've, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation, I've talked a lot about uh, semantic relations and see some cases in which uh, uh, the, uh, even the largest language models have some problems in identifying this type of semantic relation. Now, we should not forget that the identification of semantic relation was also very, as if also a pain in the neck of good old distributional semantics, in the sense that the classical distributional semantics models have always had problems in discriminating between different semantic relations. This was just a case of, uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the neighbors of words like car, good, and buy, and we, we, uh, we take a frame word to back, and we, we, we can see that uh, among the, uh, the closest neighbors of car, we can find uh, a co-hyponym, but also an hypernym, uh, good as its hypernym, as, as its uh, nearest neighbor, uh, almost synonym like excellent, but also an antonym, uh, and so on. And the same we have by and the antonym in cell, and so on. And in fact, a lot of work has been devoted in the distributional semantics in order, for instance, to identify uh, uh, semantic relations uh, in uh, distributional uh, in distributional spaces. And for instance, uh, one notorious, uh, one famous uh, uh, hypothesis uh, that uh, uh, took uh, a lot of uh, attention in, in distributional semantics uh, was the idea that semantic representations uh, where or might also be encoded really in the uh, uh, in the linear uh, where linearly represented in the uh, in the semantic spaces. Uh, this was the the so-called linear representation hypothesis that was advanced by Thomas Mikolov in 2013. And actually, it has been uh, uh, also uh, has received new attention on large language model recently in, in some papers. So basically, the idea that uh, uh, well, if we can see concepts like man and woman and king and queen as dots, as points uh, in a vector spaces, uh, actually the relationship that exists between man and woman, what we could call uh, uh, the gender relation, because woman is a feminine of man, uh, is actually encoded by this linear vector, here, by this vector here, by this direction in the space. Okay, so this direction in the, in the, the vector space encode uh, the, the semantic relation of gender, uh, which makes uh, possible to say, and that was the hypothesis, that for instance, the relationship that uh, connects man and to woman is the same as the relationship that uh, connects king to queen. 
And so basically, even if these, these elements are in different areas of the semantic space, uh, the distance and the vector linking these, uh, uh, these pairs of elements are the same. And this vector would represent uh, the, uh, uh, the gender relation. Now, that, this was a, a very interesting hypothesis and very powerful hypothesis about the structure of the, of the vector space. But unfortunately, it has been, uh, uh, although it received also a lot of attention, it has also been uh, received a lot of empirical uh, 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 falsification in the sense that uh, uh, the relationship are not so neatly encoded uh, in, in the vector spaces. Just to make an example, uh, uh, this uh, lin linear representation hypothesis was exactly used and tested in analogy, uh, in a logical test, analogy, uh, analogy resolution test. Uh, and uh, interestingly, these are just accuracy in the test, uh, where this analogy works uh, pretty well, although not perfectly, are in uh, analogies concerning morphology. So for instance, uh, walk uh, is to walk like uh, uh, um, uh, sing is to sing, or uh, and so on. Or walk, in, walk is to walk in like read is to reading, so the past progress and so on. But uh, when we, we took it into account, when you consider DAS data sets, they encode a lot of semantic relations like hypernymy, meronymy, and so on. The performance of these models on this uh, uh, analogy task uh, drops significantly. What does it mean? Alessandro, I'm afraid I have to interrupt. It's almost an hour now. And if you want some discussion, I think. Yes, I'm just closing. OK. So uh, uh, just to, to close by, uh, uh, um, so the idea is the fact that uh, large language models uh, uh, hold their uh, behavioral success to the existence of strong correlations between word concurrence statistic and semantic relations. But uh, despite this correlation, there is a, the, the semantic gap I've talked about uh, derives from the lack of a perfect isomorphism between distributional statistics and conceptual logical properties. And so basically, of course, uh, uh, the success of, uh, uh, of these models really depends on the fact that we have uh, a close uh, uh, overlap between distributional spaces, inferential space, or the physical and perceptual spaces. But this overlap is, uh, uh, is not perfect. And uh, it's exactly this type of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the difference and uh, the uh, discrepancy between these different spaces that generate uh, uh, the semantic gap. So basically, the idea is the fact that uh, uh, the reason of the semantic gap really lies uh, in the very type of knowledge that they extract from uh, linguistic data. And so the fact that uh, they actually do not extract uh, really structured theories that might support uh, an authentic inferential competence uh, in the world. Uh, what, are th what are the solutions? Uh, uh, I think that one solution uh, is exactly that we can focus uh, on methods that can leverage information acquired from statistical data, but can also learn to represent it as a truly knowledge structures. Uh, possibilities will be that we can, for instance, uh, enrich the prediction uh, learning objective uh, with semantic constraints to obtain a more refined semantic space. This is what actually uh, a lot of research that uh, was uh, uh, investigating distribution semantics models, which was called retrofitting, namely the idea that we could try to refine uh, the, uh, the learning objective of neural networks in order to learn specific semantic relations. Or for instance, also try to make these models learn semantic relations in theory directly from ground and data rather than by from scratch from, uh, 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 from large amount of text only. Okay, thank you and sorry for being late. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And now the, your discussant, uh, Friedemann Pulvermüller from the Freie Universität Berlin, uh, will discuss not the car cartography of the mind, but the cartography of the brain, I think. Go ahead, Friedemann. Yeah. I, thank you very much. Um, I, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen, for the, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, Alessandro, for your uh, fantastic talk. Uh, I will make a few comments, indeed touching upon the brain, but also 
Uh, let me let me just uh, start with more a, a more general approach, and I apologize in advance in case uh, I uh, Alessandro, you sent me kindly your slides. I may have a citation here, which was on one of the slides I saw, but which was not in the presentation anymore. So in this case, please correct me and and and. <clears throat> Uh, okay, uh, so you made a very uh, a very important point. Uh, GPT and other large language models uh, cannot do some some things about semantics. They are missing something. You speak you speak about the semantic gap. This may be related, as you mentioned, uh, by the by the by the fact that they are missing symbolic representations. Or in your words, also they 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 are missing true knowledge structures, um, real semantics in a sense, uh, uh, and and uh, in particular, inference schemes and and uh, some of them easily formulated in terms of predication are uh, are missing. So if we if we say uh, rabbits have ears, and ears do not have rabbits they, this is a this is a relationship uh, everybody knows every human but obviously as you uh, as you uh, very importantly showed uh, chat gpt is not bad at that but but uh, but but there's room for improvement likewise with inference schemes of the sort uh, that that if you yeah uh, of, of of a more complex uh, type and um, <clears throat> you also touched upon, but only very peripherally, on grounding in the world as something that could be that could be a factor. But if I understood you correctly, then uh, and please cor again correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, my impression was you 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 would suggest that adding this information about grounding might not help so much. Or are you or uh, Oh, is is this right uh, or? Uh, do you want me to answer now? I would say no. This is not fully correct in the sense that uh, I'm not saying that it's not uh, adding uh, uh, much. I'm saying that on top of lacking grounding informations, there is also a lot of uh, informations that uh, is really cannot be recorded by this statistics alone which concerns let's say more inferential uh, inferential schema i actually believe that probably one of the problems of this model is that 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 could, they could learn things like for instance part of relations by being exposed to grounding uh, uh, ground data no right yeah. for instance uh, so in that sense uh, i would i'm not saying that grounding uh, is not essential i'm saying that uh, the reference uh, problem uh, is not the only problem uh, that these models have and if uh, if they are fed with uh, uh, images or with multimodal data i think that a lot of problems come from uh, the fact that they lack uh, some uh, inferential pattern and also let me add one thing when i say that they that they lack inferential pattern i'm not uh, uh, aiming for including symbolic representation in them right so uh, I'm not arguing for the, the fact that the, 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 the way to go is uh, towards having uh, symbolic structures. Let's say that uh, uh, they, they lack uh, some aspects uh, that, on the other hand, the symbolic models, uh, of course, are able to, uh, to deal with quite neatly, which are uh, some inferences. But OK, so. Yeah, thank you for the for, thank you for, for the clarification. Let me just let me just uh, continue. And. Um, my my uh, one point I wanted to make is that if we look at standard semantic theories, uh, they uh, they also uh, you may also uh, bring up against those that they do not include uh, true knowledge structures in the sense of uh, something that would allow inferential schemes. It's also if you if we if you look at for example the Collins Loftus model or, or the or any uh, or uh, if we if we replace here the concepts by words and look at the co-occurrence probabilities in uh, in in recent distributional models there there is just uh, there, there is just a uh, a cor uh, the correlation structure is mapped, but not 
these logical inference schemes. Likewise, yeah. if we uh, if if we look at uh, semantic feature models, they also are composed of uh, a, a particular representation is uh, is is described in terms of a set of features and feature values, and those would also not necessarily be uh, easy to translate into uh, into inference schemes. So. Uh, so if we and and we and we may now we may now say the, the, that these semantic models are uh, in a, in a sense uh, if if they come with features and these features and and we restrict consideration to those that have that have semantic grounding in the world, um, then uh, we and and clear criteria for what uh, what what the feature corresponds to in the world, uh, we have a we have a pathway. From this type of model uh, uh, to the to to a grounding uh, approach, and my question would be uh, whether indeed semantic representations are similar between these different types of uh, of, of of models, or whether we could expect that by uh, by by, by complementing distributional semantic models with uh, with with grounding, uh, we might improve the semantic representations already. And uh, and 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 finally, I will uh, make a few uh, brief comment how this might uh, might indeed lead to something like uh, basic inference schemes. Uh, this is a citation you uh, which I found on your previous slide. Uh, and and there you say that it's uh, that it's um, that that we actually would hope that there is a a degree of correspondence between uh, or overlap between this between the semantic information coming from distributional statistics and from the world, mm -hmm. and uh, so ideally they would provide the same information. Some people have claimed that others. Uh, uh, but but one one might indeed object and say, is this indeed so? Would world world correlations? So the question: How frequently, uh, how well do words co-occur in texts? And would world world word correlations? Uh, so so uh, how uh, how good is the consistency between the occurrence of a word and a certain pattern mm -hmm. in the world uh, in 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 the environment in gr the grounding pattern? Uh, how would how would they relate to each other? Would they be indeed congruent, or only similar, or or, or a little bit overlapping? And. Um, and uh, of course, uh, everybody knows that we can uh, we can convert these distributional semantics into semantic ve uh, vectors and measure, for example, the similarity between two the semantic similarity of two words in this particular framework in the distributional semantic uh, framework. We can also do the same thing in a grounding perspective, for example, by using features, grounded features, and build huge vector spaces with those, and also likewise measure angles between or including distances between uh, the conceptual representations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and, and now the, uh, the question might be whether these vectors are, in a sense, the distributional and the grounding ones are the same indeed as hoped, or rather not so much. Uh, and one way of uh, of assessing and, and visualize, visualizing these similarity spaces is uh, is called a method called representational similarity analysis. This got famous in the brain research domain, but it can also be applied to looking at uh, you know, cognitive uh, and semantic measures and, and compare those and 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 one could well, one could for example then use one particular uh, distributional semantic approach and compare it with a grounding experiential uh, semantic approach this is a result 
Here we have a uh, hundred words or so divided in six categories, um, related words, animals, uh, tool words, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and, and so each word category has, I think, uh, uh, 16 or so uh, items. And you can see the matrix would show you the similarity of, uh, of, of a given word uh, with, with other words from the same category, subcategory, from a larger category, here action words, and here at the lower right, object words, and and then uh, and 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 then of course the diagonal is here the self similarity which is of course always very high therefore we don't look at it and and then we see for uh, so uh, what we can see here is that the degree of dissimilarity is rather low sometimes for the for the individual categories especially here and sometimes there's a huge difference, uh, a great dissimilarity here in red and, and yellow uh, between the action word and object word categories, for example. Now, the interesting thing is, if we uh, if we look at distributional models and, uh, and experiential models, they pro produce very different patterns. And the correlation between those two are, is not uh, overwhelming. So, and and if you if you look more qualitatively at what they do, you see, for example, here that the space of action words is nicely divided into subcategories in the experiential grounded model, but the distributional model makes a big mess here. So it, it, it's not really well able to to separate different types of action words. Likewise, here in the object word space. Uh, we see here in the distributional model a very nice delineation of this uh, of this category. This is food words in this case, and uh, while here in the in the in the experiential grounding model we do not see much. It seems that this category, this subgroup, is subdivided in different parts. But on the other hand, here we see a very good uh, a very good mapping of this of this category of this category of animal words which is not so clear in the distributional model. So essentially, we see semantic similarities of different kinds, uh, most in, uh, best captured in the, by the different models. Uh, there has been recent research on, on, the, on brain activation, where people then looked uh, here, for example, a study by Fernandino, where, where, they, where, where they looked uh, whether the brain activations patterns would actually be similar to the to the semantic similarity structure of uh, of different semantic models and their their message in the 2022 paper was in pnas they said grounded models did much better than uh, than 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 competing semantic models here, for example, the in red distributional models. Uh, so 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 they they say if we look at the brain, uh, at least at uh, if we if we restrict consideration on those areas here in red, which are thought to be semantic hubs, uh, then we see that, we, that the similarity of brain activation, the similarity structure of brain activation is, uh, is, uh, is best matched by the similarity structure of the grounding, uh, of, of the grounded the, the, uh, semantic vectors. And this is, uh, so we, we took a slightly different approach. We uh, we did not restrict our consideration. Uh, Car Francesca Carota uh, and and in collaboration with uh, with Nico Kriegerskortis uh, group, uh, we, we we did a series of studies of a similar sort already much earlier, and and then also here in this study we compared directly exper an experimental model, experiential grounded model with a distributional model, and and found here entirely distinct brain areas that mapped these semantic similarity. 
So unlike the previous study by, by Fernandino, we see just dissociated brain areas that map the different types of semantic similarity. So from here, the suggestion arises, adding grounded semantic information to distributional semantics may lead to a more complete picture of the semantic space. So, so, so we, uh, we would then include, of course, uh, symbol uh, reference uh, relationships, world, word learning, and likewise, um, and, 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 and those would likewise go into representational semantic similarities. And uh, so, yeah, so, so this is, this is uh, one of the suggestions I would make the other uh, uh, vaguer Su uh, suggestion uh, or, or, or more tentative, uh, sorry, not vague, but more tentative suggestion is that if we build uh, networks now, not according to the most efficient method at, uh, at the moment, but if we allow the networks to become more similar uh, to the brain and biologically realistic, we may observe, and we did this in a series of sim simulations experiments, that uh, with realistic neural network structure and heavy learning, so a realistic type of uh, le learning, also not error back, pro back propagation or some, some other error driven uh, 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 algorithm. And we 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 see the development of um, categorical representations and uh, and and uh, and and indeed symbolic representations in the sense that we we uh, we see then in the network representations of a word form interlinked with neurons. That, uh, that 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 symbolize or or index are grounded in different semantic features of the reference of the of the category term and uh, so, so the, the individual neural elements may correspond to a feature like has four legs or barks here in the case of the word dog and the different dog exemplars um, and uh, and and here it's entirely clear that if we activate the word form representation, we get activation of these, these um, of these semantic feature neurons in the conceptual part of the of the grounded representation. But the other way round, the activation does not work if we only activate this single neuron and uh, its few connections to the word form representations will not be sufficient simply because more activation is necessary to activate the linguistic semantic representation. So far, my comments, I thank you very much. And uh, it's a uh, thanks again for an excellent talk. And thank you for an excellent commentary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, if I can add, uh, okay. Uh, well, I, I think I kind of agree with you in the sense that uh, uh, there is some of the results that you you, uh, you showed are in line with the positions I had in the sense that uh, the if you go to the slide about uh, uh, the distributional space, right, the difference between the distributional, the, the similarity, uh, and oh, that one, that one, uh, exactly. So it's interesting how the distributional model, poor distribution information, is a much more messy organization than poor experiential one, right? And this is concerned only semantic similarities, uh, where uh, in a way, uh, one, if we, what I consider in the talk are uh, different type of semantic relations that are already, I think, uh, uh, even more complex than semantic similarity. So I think it is exactly is consistent with what I claim in the sense that, uh, of course, there is an overlap between uh, what is encoded in language about the world and the world itself. Okay, there is an overlap so that we can recover a lot of semantic information from distributional data alone. But this type of overlap is not a perfect isomorphism. It's not a perfect uh, alignment, so to speak. That's why in a way, uh, I mean, we cannot simply take distributional data as a surrogate uh, for experiential, uh, experiential one. I totally agree that for instance, adding uh, 
also uh, uh, that's why this is also what i mentioned in my last slide so for instance uh, why not try and why not imagine that these models actually learn basic semantic relations uh, from the grounded world, in the sense, I guess that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, basic re cognitive relations like part of or location or spatial relations are truly acquired not via language, but are acquired especially from uh, from grounded experience. Yes. So, and, uh, and indeed, it's so if you look in the literature, in the, in the philosophical literature, in the psychological literature, it's indeed so that, for example, uh, Hume, Claimed that 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 from experiencing billiard balls, you can exactly. learn the concept of co of causality. Exactly. And, and then and then one step further, it was um, it it, uh, it it was um, uh, it was Piaget mm -hmm. who actually who actually said that uh, that the child learns the concept of consality now not with billiard balls but rather with making an action and observing the consequence exactly so basically exactly even for causation so to speak so the, the problem is that of course these models learn this type of relations only by and through linguistic patterns the problem is that these linguistic patterns do not uh, uh, let's say isomorphically uh, uh, correlate with uh, causal relations. So, in, because, for instance, we express the causal relations in languages uh, not always uh, in the same. I mean, we don't describe in language uh, cause and effects in exact uh, always in the same way in which we experience them. Okay, uh, and that's why I think uh, that's also I think it's where lies the problem. So the fact that these models uh, only acquire semantic relations. Uh, through uh, through language, and uh, so I think that one way, of course, one possibility. Uh, that's why I, it's something I that, that I skipped in the slide. I said, okay, some people say, okay, let's assume that you could interface this model with some symbolic knowledge base. Okay, but I don't, I don't, I don't think this is the correct answer because we we need the, to uh, to make yeah. models that are able to learn this uh, type of relation and to structure this this type of conceptual theory. From data, the problem is that uh, these type of theories are probably uh, learned from the wrong type of data, or, uh, or uh, and so on. Because, uh, for instance, even the so-called multimodal language models like GPT-4, GPT, and so on, do not learn uh, some relation from scratch image data from multimodal data. They simply combine. Uh, uh, let's say a huge uh, 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 model learned from language, from a huge model learned from uh, um, from data, from 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 image data. I think that, for instance, uh, it would probably uh, a, a viable possibility would be to explore whether basic semantic relations could be learned first from uh, uh, non-linguistic data and then use this information as a kind of semantic constraints uh, for the model then to apply this type of relations to other data and so on. Yeah, yeah this is a very important point. And, uh, and, and it could be that the two strategies would be complementary. And this is also what this slide, by the way, suggests, because here we have an integrated model where the, uh, where the where the semantic similarity spaces are, so to speak, uh, uh, summed up, mm -hmm. and uh, and and here you see a very nice delineation of all the subcategories. Uh, so taking the best of both two of of both worlds. Exactly. And, and, so and, I think uh, I, my position or, is, that, of course, that distributional data allow you to project uh, ground and knowledge uh, also to other things that you have not directed experience, right? Uh, but in a way, uh, uh, you, you need to have some grounded information from, from started with uh, in order to learn basic, uh, uh, let's say, the basic component of the conceptual theories. And those basic components like causal relations, part of location and so on, I think uh, are not directly to be learned from, from linguistic structures. That's the idea. Yeah. Sure. I think we fully agree there. Okay, uh, we have some <laughs> questions. Do, do you want to continue or there are some questions? From no, 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 no. Please, please. Okay, uh, Julia, but keep the but keep the questions short and the answers short. We have very little time left. Yes. Julia Zimmerman and then Nicolas Goulet. 
Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I was wondering um, when you interpreted the part of feature from Templeton, um, why not interpret it as Moronomy plus a metaphorical extension of Moronomy? Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, the problem, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, but that's exactly the point in the sense that uh, uh, in a way, a, Meron a Meronymic extension uh, is not the same one as a true Meronym in relation. That's what I meant. Okay. In the, I think uh, this type of information, it's really something which is encoded in the linguistic pattern. The linguistic pattern exactly encode the true Meronymy plus uh, a lot of extensions of it uh, in a non-true meronymic uh, uh, meronymic uh, uh, interpretation. So, of course, w w my point in showing that, that the uh, small example is the fact that uh, you sh we should be. I mean, we still have to understand uh, uh, to what uh, how this type of uh, basic uh, and semantic relations are truly encoded uh, uh, by these models. Uh, they, this uh, alleged semantic feature of the models uh, may still be uh, a lot of connected to surface linguistic patterns rather than true, truly semantic uh, uh, elements. That was my point. Okay. Uh, Nicola, yep. short question. Yep. Uh, I was wondering if you think that uh, semantic formalisms like uh, abstract meaning representation or the more recent one, the Babel net meaning representation are of interest in the context of bridging the gap caused by the missing link you described? You mean the abstract meaning representation? Yep, for example, it, it, because it, it seemed very similar to the graph you showed on your last slide with the- uh, Yes or no, in the sense. Okay, yeah, uh, the point, uh, that's what I, okay. Uh, I think that the problem is uh, I would like the model to learn this. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we we might try uh, to learn uh, this type of representation from uh, annotated data, for instance, in which we have this explicit relation. It would be like like saying, okay, I have some. Uh, 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 I, I learned this type of relations from uh, uh, pairs that I know from uh, that are meronyms or encode some other type of uh, other type of relations. Okay, uh, in that sense, uh, I think that might be uh, a useful uh, uh, try and a useful uh, experiment to do. Uh, what I wouldn't like to do is to have a kind of a neurosymbolic approach in, in which we have. Uh, let's say the language models and uh, for instance, uh, a formal language on which you want to map, on which you want to translate uh, uh, your uh, linguistic uh, expressions. For instance, like in the probabilistic language of thought uh, uh, hypothesis, which I mean, I think it's, it's a really fine model, but uh, uh, it's assumed that you basically took uh, the language models uh, and the language model translate uh, natural language into these formal structures uh, that are then uh, given an in input uh, uh, to, to a formal engine. So I think that uh, in this case, it uses uh, this type of combination of uh, language model and symbolic representation. Uh, uh, I don't find it very uh, interesting for me, at least, at least in the sense of asking the question, how we do we learn? this type of knowledge? How do we learn this type of uh, uh, abstraction in that sense? Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll end this session now and remind you that the next speaker will be Danilo Zdok and not Tom Griffiths who has been moved to Friday at 3.30 p.m. because of COVID. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Friedemann, for your very nice discussion. Yeah, thank you for, for your excellent talk and for uh yeah for, for, for the nice interaction. See you. <laughs>